May I ask, uh, is here anyone who is not using continuous integration for a project he's doing? May I see some hands? You should always ask positive questions. Yes. <laughs> Who is doing continuous integration for this project? You know, like that, you don't say. <laughs> 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 Some people, just, just that you know, some people ask me to get some uh, overview on uh, Jenkins. And we have a uh, Jenkins expert. He's an in Inria engineer that uh, Inria asked to work in our project. So we converted him with a uh, small code. <laughs> he was doing Java a long time ago now. <laughs> and he was one of the responsible for the Java uh, integra continuous integration server for the, all the eight labs in France. So this means that he's really expert into that. So, so what we propose is that after the talk of here, I realized that there was nothing on the program. So you could have a presentation of uh, Jenkins and things like that, and hands on. Okay. In the hands on, so Friday you could have on your laptop Something that yes, we might guess. So, so now, okay. yes, everyone hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Dick Lais. I'm a software engineer for sync up systems, mainly working on Big Studio. Uh, I'm lead developer for modeling and mapping tool, for which I did presentations in the past. But since May this year, I'm also involved in the new native uh, Sync of Smalltalk UI. It's currently an Opic Studio centric uh, solution. Opic Studio always used native Windows. But uh, we might, in a later time, bring this down to Visual Works. We don't know yet at the moment. So I first want to focus on some related talks. Uh, tomorrow, Neil Ross is talking about Glorp, which I'm also heavily involved with because of the mapping tool, which also uses Glorp. I just heard that Tom Robinson has moved to Thursday. He will be talking about Store. The talking red is from Andreas Hiltner. He's on tomorrow afternoon. And it's a talk that's directly related to this one. I'm doing more about the presentation and how you use the new GUI. Andreas Hiltner wrote the entire interface between Smalltalk and Windows. So he's more technical talk. If you're interested in it, be sure to attend it. And then on Thursday, Arden Thomas will be showing his uh, Sync of Smalltalk project. Now, what about the project? The project started around uh, April last year, I think. And in uh, at ESIC last year in Ghent, Andreas did a lightning talk about what he already had. So he had some examples, uh, very simple examples of different widgets. And we continued on that one. I took this slide from Andreas, you will see it again tomorrow because I think it's a very important slide. Why we are doing this project and what our goals are. The old Obix Studio API is, an, like I said, an old one. It's written in C, and it's very difficult to maintain, to extend. It was almost impossible. Since I'm involved with the Opic Studio Mapping and Modeling tool, I was pushing these limits on a daily basis. And that's why for now, we slowed up development on this, and we wait to finish this uh, project. So the intention is to modernize the UI controls and widget, eliminate primitives and use the L LCC, so we have no more C code, and it should be easy to maintain and extend. Now, when we saw the demo of Andreas in, at ESA get, of course we had some questions ourselves on how does this exactly work? Does this work for a regular business application?
application, can we really use it? What's the performance? If we ask changes, how easy is it to extend? So, as part of that solution, uh, I volunteered to build some applications, some simple applications, some simple UIs with a business background. Now, as some of you know, I have this other hobby, which is about whiskey. <laughs> I collect, uh, sell, buy whiskies. And for this, I have, a, I have an own personal database, which, which is not super big, but it's, it's big enough to do some experiments with. So I don't know if you ever tried to write sample UIs, but it's always hard to find data, useful data. So we had this for our demo. So I will first show a small demo of a screen of a start of an application we did with this. So this is our launcher, and you, we go later deeper into it, but you see gradients, you see large uh, pictures. So if you knew the old API, you would know that this is hard with the old uh, object studio. So if I start a demo, you see that I open the UI. At top we have large buttons with the uh, PNGs on it. We simply enter the name of the product in the field. Click go, and then the stuff. Products appear. You see that we have icons in front of the products, which indicate which what kind of a product it is. We have strings, we have conditional formatting, on which I will tell more later. I scrambled the names of the suppliers, so I didn't want them to be. And we also have numbers, so we can show fixed points, we can show integers, so it's not a problem. Now, if we select an item, you see that the uh, drop-down box is filled in, entry fields are filled in, and we also have some checkboxes. We can do a radio, but all that's implemented and we can use it. If I take another tab page, you see it's supplier information. The red icon means that the product is no longer available, it is suppliers. We have article numbers, a whole lot of price information. Dates, you can show dates as well, in the format you want. And if we now go to sales, you see that we have an evolution of the prices. These are sales prices, so how do you, they evolve over time. And on the other list here, you will see that we have sales prices. So top are, for example, sales of samples, which are just two or three centiliters, and then the, uh, two on the bottom of our uh, wheel sales of pockets. If I click the prices button, I draw a graph, a line graph, with the price evolution of, the, of this product. All this is done, small talk, and windows, so no, nothing else is involved here. If I take another product, yeah. go back to the graph, you will see the graph has changed. So with announcements, we simply uh, do the interaction between the two windows. So if I go back to the original product, I have back the original graph. Next we have stock information. So the list gives a view of the stock movements. And on the right, the current sto stock, uh, the value of this. And a graph, the little blue part means what this product uh, represents in the entire stock value. Next up, we have uh, order information. So I have two orders for this one. The quantity ordered, the quantity, the quali quantity delivered. And we also have a graph there for them. If we click on one of the orders, the graph changes. So. And then last, we have a picture. If we click on the picture, we use the scroll, but we can zoom in on the picture. So we can go <coughs> into detail. If you right-click the picture, you go back to the original format. All this again. Simply windows. The core that Andreas created, I started playing with it. I told him, hey, we need this, we need that. How easy is it? And most of the times it was pretty easy to implement. At least for me, I don't know for Andreas. I <laughs> find it more difficult for him. So we'll go into detail of. Yeah, that was 
Huh? Okay, so this was a launcher. So you see a gradient background. It's not a BitLab or a PNG, it's really drawn by Windows. And the buttons are a UI owner of draw button, which is actually a PNG that we can use as a push button. If you wanted to do this with the old public studio API, we needed to draw a bitmap, which looked a bit like the gradient. You find that as a background, create large push buttons and put a bitmap in front of them to have the large buttons where they are. Another nice feature we have is when you hover over the button. If you hover over the button, you see that a hot frame appears. So there's a simple event or announcement that is being made and uh, the system is defined so to draw a blue border around the button. Uh, why is there a lag in timing? So why does it wait for one or two seconds until the frame occurs? Uh, the, the, that's the fault windows, I think. I haven't really checked that. Did you know that in US? It's, we, get the, we get the event right away. It's really just for us uh, like a um, tooltip window uh, for the hot rod to, to, to show up, to show in this case that you can do that. So it's it's intentional, it's not directly. So it's, it's, you put that in? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Something yeah. we put in. One, one and a half second back. So how do we do this with code? We create a new UI view. We give it a position. It's a starting position. It's a simple point, 15 at 50 in this case. We give it an extent, which is also a point. It's the width and the height. We give it a title, simple text. Then we have two possibilities. The second UI you saw with the tab pages has a background brush, which is defined like this, window brush, new color, RGB color blue. The launcher had another brush, it was a GDIP background brush, and that's defined this way. So we specify a rectangle, we give the begin color and end color, and then we tell what kind of gradient we want. And the system draws this for us. We then create the window, set default events and default styles for it, and we give it an icon. You saw in the, the icon of the application was not the default of its studio one, it was one defined by our own. So we get that icon either from the cache, and if we don't have it yet, we read it in from file and use that one. And then we re-display it. Creating widgets. Let's uh, look at the UI owner draw button. So we add the widget to the controller, or to the, yeah, to the controller. We tell it to give it an identifier so we know which item we're working it with. We give it a class, we give it a rectangle, which is a uh, begin position and the, a position and extent. We give it an options. Uh, we've done this for backward compatibility. We want to see how backward compatible can we make it with the current API. And actually the identity dictionary is simple. Uh, the key is, the ins is an instance variable which has an access uh, setter and the value we want to set. You will see later that we are using other examples for this one. And we tell the form on which we want to put the item, the widget. In this case it's the main window. In another example you see that we put it on a tab page. And we assign a file name that we want to display on the widget. Then we set default events. In this case, this is the hoover. When we move over it, let it changes. A UI edit field, it's more or less the same. We give it a rectangle, we give it options. In this case, it's an identity dictionary. We can extract and style into Windows uh, constants. Right now we're using this, but over time we probably use uh, small box symbols for this to make it more readable. I should have done this one. 
Uh, we give it a text, in this case it's a blank text, and we tell it to be on the tab info. So it says on tab page where to the verb. We assign a team, which is the standard Windows team in this case, and we give it a presentation. Now, I'm not going directly into the presentation, but the next slide can tell a lot about this. You'll, you'll probably get bored of this one at the end, but it's very important for our current uh, design. We create a window, we set the default, and we update it so it refreshes itself. So how do they work? Control versus the presentation. We have an entry field, and we have a business object that we want to display a value from in the entry field. We create a UI edit control, which has a lot of uh, instance variables, but I'm picking out two of them, object and presentation. Presentation is an object UI presentation, which also has a lot of subclasses depending on which control you're building. Some of the instance variable access path, setup path, format, decision block, image path, align. Uh, we'll see most how they are used in the coming slides. So we, there we define what we want to display, how we want to display it, and so on. We assign the business object to the object instance variable of the control, and then we update, we send update window to the control, and with the information from the object and from the presentation, the UI control knows what to display and how to display it. So let's look at access paths set apart. They are associated with each other. The access path can either be a symbol, an array of symbols, or a block. So it's simply the method that's being sent to the object, if it's a symbol. If it's an array, it's a chain of methods that are being sent to the object. And if it's a block, we give the object as an as a argument, and the code is executed from the block, the return value is displayed in the field. The setup part is more or less the same. It can be nil. In that case, we either don't set the object again, we reset it, don't reset it. But if the access part is a symbol or an array of symbols, we use this access part and simply add a semicolon at the last method. So we can set the value. You can also use the same symbol or an array of symbols, or you can use a block but you need two arguments there with the object and the value of it. So an example could be widget presentation, access part, name, set up part, you so. We also use the presentation for columns in this sheet. In this case, I'm going to discuss the sort access part. On the list queue, we have this item center liters, which is a string that we display, but for sorting we want to be sure that we use the value, which is in the teacher. So we define the access part as being object volume, we print string and we add set to leader to it. But the sort access part, we use the object volume, so we show that we use the integer value of the object. Uh, if you don't assign the sort access part, we use the display value. So we simply use the access part to do the sort. And I added an alignment, in this case it's right, so... Um, I have one question. Two, two slides back, please. The setting, setting symbols. Um, yeah. So the setter path could be a symbol and you add a column to construct the setter, right? Yeah. Why do you do that? Because um, when you use, I don't know, um, implementers or senders of, of some kind of column kind of selector, you cannot find it. So you, you change your name column uh, selector and then you, f you want to see the senders, you can't find it, yeah? Yeah, yeah. well we thought it was ease of use. We thought it was easier to use without the same column. Yeah, but you lose the reference. Wait, we, we can, we can review that. That's not a problem. Well, we have to discuss this. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, please discuss it. This is still, like I said, this is still very early okay. experiments with it, so we are just 
See. At the moment, we're just trying out different stuff and right. seeing yeah. how they work. And so the, the other issue with this is it's very improv, improv, not performance, right? So you have to change the symbol into a string, add something, and then change it back to a symbol, yeah. and this change it back to a symbol is a possible, possible. Actually, I would prefer if you use the block. Yeah, block. It's more or less, yes. because you can do a lot more with the block than with the symbol. But it was simply ease of use uh, and experiment with it. So. No, but I think symbols with a column at the end is just fine too. Yeah, probably. Okay, thank you. So we're just playing around with this now. <laughs> so the image part, this is this icon we show in front of the column, in the front of the list view. And for this we use an image list. An image list is a collection of equally sized uh, uh, pictures, actually, images. They are sent to the control, and there's a zero index based uh, collection created. So if we want to access this image list, we use the image part, and we return an index in the image list. Now, this is a problem at the moment where we keep it like this because it's very performant. We try different stuff, and this is the most performant uh, way to do it. But we have a relationship between the uh, object and the list we use in the UI. So we need to get rid of that somewhere, but for now, for the demos, for the testing, we keep it like this because it's very performant, it's very good working. And, uh, well. Then conditional format, which is actually a very nice uh, way to do. You saw the suppliers, they had different colors, so the yellow background with red letters means that the product is no longer available. Uh, yellow letters means that it's uh, hard to get, but he claims he still has it, but we don't know about that. And green means it's currently easy available. So what do we do? We create an access path, it's uh, actually a whole uh, bunch of executions because we have even access database there. So we find the cheapest supplier we have at the moment for this product. If we don't have one, because a bottle can be in the system just for uh, references. And if we have a supplier, we should show the name. Now we assign an identity dictionary of formats. We create a key plus equal minus. Plus means available, equal difficult to get, minus is no longer available. And we assign a different formats, which have fonts, colors, and backgrounds. Then the decision block is executed on the object. The method available returns a string either plus, equals, or minus, and we change that into a symbol so we find it in the identity dictionary. And the system displays the right color, the right format. We can change fonts and then we can do a whole lot of stuff there. Drop down list boxes are even are more complex. Because we have a product and a brand, there's a product has one brand, the brand has multiple products. And if we want to show a brand of a project, we just show one brand. But if you click it open the list, you need a list of different brands which are not related to this object. To create this, we set the object of the drop down list to the current product. And we have a presentation list which is a collection of all the brands we have in the system. Then we assign an access part, which is our current product brand. So the, the drop-down list knows which brand it has to select in the view. And to display, we use a display value, which goes over all the brands and displays the name in the drop-down list. If you don't define it, we use the simple print. So you don't have to define it if your print method is uh, so configured that it's useful. You don't need to use this block. Graphics also have an object and a presentation. There are some extra instance variables like the donut style, which means that we have this hole in the middle. We have uh, 
additional stuff like the total value blocks which calculates the total value of your price so it knows how to do percentage. We have access pen, access pen, access fonts and so on. Um, the intention is that we have an object representation and that the system knows how to draw the graph. So you don't have to do too much yourself. We have extra formats like a UI bar chart format and a UI pie chart format. Right now, these are, in my example, these are simply polished, but you can use textures in there, you can use gradients in there. So we have a lot of things that you can do. One more extension we had to make was uh, access part and decision blocks can be an array of access parts. Because in this case, we have a quantity ordered and a quantity delivered. So on the same object, we need to show two values. So we have this array. Yeah. Then the second demo I'm going to show you is about how to use the tree field. It's actually a demo I did for uh, Stick. Showed it there as well. Um, the tree view we wanted to make it work, but we had got it working, but we didn't find you yet. So that's why I don't discuss the, how we access it because we need some more. Work. So I call it the encyclopedia. So we open this one and we see a tree view. If we hover over a text, the text changes. We have uh, uh, tool tips. We have icons in front of it. If I take the Netherlands, we simply see that the Netherlands don't have regions. We go directly to one of the whiskey brands. If you click on them, you see what bottles they have available there. And if we open up, you see there's a horizontal scroll bar, no vertical one. We click open, we see the whiskey they have. So they have one rye whiskey, the others are single malt whiskeys. But the Netherlands is not really a whiskey country, sorry for the Dutch people here. Uh, we take a look at Scotland, <laughs> for Neil to, to make Neil happy. And you see that we have regions there, so we have an additional uh, hierarchy in the Scotland area than in the other ones. If you click on for the regions, you saw that the icon changed in front of it. So this is also one of the features we have. If we click on the distillery, you see the bubbles. We have horizontal and vertical scroll bars if they are needed. We see the bubbles they have for player apple in this case. And if we select one of the bubbles, is about to occur now. You see that we can show transparent pictures. We read these from files, so this goes really very quickly, and these are quite huge files. We also have no transparent pictures, so we can do almost anything. One last thing I want to show is on the route we have an entry field which contains a location of a file, it's an AV file. I press a play button and the movie starts playing. You don't hear audio because the recording tool. Yeah. The recording tool doesn't show any. Uh, doesn't record the audio, but if you do the demo live, you will see that there is actually audio being displayed. Now this is, is one example uh, that really proves how extendable it is. Uh, I asked a little bit before uh, Stick at Andreas that I wanted to show this moving, and he said, "No way." I think it was Friday at around 4 o'clock. I said, no, I cannot do this. I will start to wait, but so he decided, okay, come back to me Monday, maybe I can come up with something. And I think two hours later, around 6, I received an email from him, hey, try this with this version. I think it works, and it really worked. So this went really very quickly. Also, there's no gum or lay involved. It's simply small top methods, codes, and the Windows API. Question for the tree view. I see you use different fonts for different hierarchies, but uh, you don't have enough space. So could you, have yeah. to get, could you have the lines adjusted differently? We so should do that. But so you could do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The demo was just to show hey, we can show different formats. Yeah, no it problem. was more experimenting. What can we do with this? How does it work? We no, didn't really you make it. Wanted to make it nice. We wanted to show. No, show it's off. just that you need that feature. So if 
So this was my talk. Um, if you want to play with this, you have to register on the OST Dev program. Uh, contact Arden for that. He can register you right away. If you have other questions about Stick Up Small Talk, contact Susan for, uh, or Arden Thomas. Or you can send an email to Jeremy Jordan. Um, I myself am here till Friday, so if you have any questions, you can always talk with me. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? So the, the business graphics you show, the, the bar charts and so on, so did you implement them in Smalltalk or is this a, a Windows control with you? Well, it's a Windows. Uh, well, no, pardon me. It's Smalltalk actually. Uh, we create the presentation, we tell uh, the scale of the, the uh, accesses. We give it the values, no, actually we give it the objects and the methods how to access them. And that we pass on, the values are calculated by the Smalltalk application, and that's all passed to Windows. And Windows drop, just the drawing, but all the rest is done in Smalltalk. But the, widget, the widget does the should do the calculation for you. You don't have to do this yourself. Um, so how far is that from production? Um, so you say it's in the, the development versions, um, but now the next version is coming soon, right? Yeah. What is yes. it there? So I think our could give more about that. We have, we have the, the next version that's coming out very shortly. That's been that's been done from engineering for uh, earlier this summer. The versions of the product that are coming out, we're actually waiting for government export. Okay before we can ship that. It's been delivered from engineering for six weeks. But what they're working on, there will be some pieces in that. And what Turk also mentioned, if you want to see pieces of this and as it develops, become part of the Object Studio development program. And if you're interested in signing up for that, Is it different from contact me. Is it different from VW did? Yes. Yes, there's two programs. So you can get all the, the builds as we build them, uh, weekly or monthly, for our products to see the, the new pieces going in and work with them and give us feedback and, and even influence if things are broken or for your needs and requirements as we're, as we're building them and developing them internally. So I highly recommend those, those two programs if you have any interest at all. And uh, uh, we're, we're targeting the next major release in 2014 for, for, for full use of this. Next next summer. Next summer. Yeah. I have a question. I have plans to add a layout manager or some some widget and not to yeah, the user have to define each rectangle and its position. We already we already discussed that, but we I'm sure that we need that, but uh, we still need to discuss this further within the team, but uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's not directly related to the Windows API, but yeah. I think it's, it's okay. very nice. We think we should have layouts so you, your object know actually which layouts they use um, automatically. Sure. So I think if, if I'm on that, may I ask that question? Uh, answer my question. Um, the, we are using the, or we're going to use the layout manager. There is a current layout manager in development in VisualWorks, and that's the, the, the one we want to use to share between VisualWorks and, and Objective Studio in this case. So there will be a layout manager, there will be a new painter and a new designer, um, and that's probably going to share at least four functionality between the, those two, uh, two dialects. Um, uh, what I can show you tomorrow is already how far we are in integration in terms of syntax highlighting, because that was the first step that, uh, that we did, that was the easiest part. Uh, next step is the, uh, yeah, as you said, the layout manager, which is worked on by another engineer, Mars, as we speak. Uh, we're going to use that for, for Object Studio. Um, and yes, absolutely. So we know that we, we use it, that we need it. 
and uh, it's not just used for uh, for object studio or dish words, but for both. Thank you.